Hello everyone, a very good afternoon. Today we are going to talk about one of my favorite valves, which is the mitral valve. And I think most of us have, you know, our favorite uh, valve lesion is also mitral stenosis, which I hope is fairly easier than mitral regurgitation counterpart. But again, sorry, Dr. Nabi, it is echo versus CMR, but you all know who's the winner. I don't want to say that, but you know who's the winner. <laughs> Sadly, I don't have any disclosures. All I can say is we've got the food today. And for audience online, please don't forget our favorite Twitter handles. And for our viewers on live stream, please subscribe and follow the Beke Institute for Cardiovascular Education and Training for current updates in cardiovascular sciences. So welcome, everyone. And of course, we are going to base our discussion as directed by our valvular stenosis guidelines from 2009 and the updated ACC HA valve guidelines, which actually changed our perspective and numbers, you know, when it comes to mitral stenosis. Well, let's learn some of the interesting facts in history about mitral stenosis. I'm not sure if how many of you are aware. It was actually the first valve lesion described by Dr. Vusens in 1705, guys. Can you imagine that? 1705. And he actually described this as bony transformation of the valve, which is amazing. So I didn't know we were dealing with more than, you know, uh, 300 years of uh, mitral stenosis. And it was the first ever valve lesion treated by surgery in 1923. And the first ever valve disease to be diagnosed by echo as actually is mitral stenosis. And that was in 1968. And the first ever valve lesion treated successfully with the percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty in 1984. I just wanted to show you this cute video of exercise stress auscultation in good olden days. I'm sure I'm missing Dr. Q and Dr. Zogby to comment on this, but uh, you know, I really found this video to be cute. I think they're making the patient exercise and they're auscultating to listen to the murmur. Just amazing, right? And uh, you know, today we have the luxury of you know, 3D, 4D, everything on the click of a button, but you know, I, I really think we need to remember those good olden days. Now let's talk about what we know in 2024. Like we just talked about, we have come a long way with mitral stenosis, so let's see what we know about it in 2024. But before we go in, I know you all know that I'm a Jeopardy enthusiast, and I know you, you, you know for sure that I'm gonna ask you a question or two, right? So please feel free to answer whoever knows this. What is this? Any takers? I can tell you I'm showing mitral stenosis with atrial septal defect, right? Any fellows? I think somebody already said it, Gina. Yeah, I think we need to phone a friend you whenever we have a Jeopardy team. So it is Lutenbacher syndrome, right? It was described actually way, you no, know, multiple years ago, uh, and it's a fairly common association, you know, in the, in the olden days. What is this one? And you know it is related to mitral stenosis. So we have mitral stenosis, which can cause severely dilated left atrium. And if you see, there is a dilated pulmonary artery. And we are showing something called, yeah, I think Rodi got that. Amazing, uh, Rodi. That is Ortner syndrome. Actually, it causes recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis from the dilated LA, which actually causes cardiovocal hoarseness. And, and you know, it's actually a very uh, you know, common question on the boards as well. What about this one? Cyanotic, red and congested cheeks. You know patient has severe mitral stenosis. We don't see this quite often these days because we do catch the disease pretty early. But this is nothing but mitral fasces. It's called mitral fasces because of the way it looks. All right, let's move into the discussion, I should say. So obviously our outline is going to be a little bit about mitral valvular anatomy. All of us know our mitral valve very well, but just a quick recap. A little bit on causes and anatomic presentation and how do we really use echo to assess mitral stenosis as the chunk of our discussion today. And finally, a little bit about how to grade mitral stenosis and also a little bit about management, although we don't have too much time uh, you know, to discuss the details. And again, one thing I really want to say, all of us here, I think everyone in this room know mitral valvular anatomy, like, you know what I mean, even in your deep sleep, in your REM sleep, I'm sure you're thinking about mitral valve all the time. 
Uh, but again, one thing I do want to reiterate that it's not just the leaflets, right? So if you think about it, the left atrial wall and the LV myocardium also actually form this whole mitral apparatus. So that's something you want to think about because again, we talked about this during our aortic stenosis session too. So don't look just at the valve, right? Look at the big picture. So what is the valve doing to the heart or to the LV, to the RV is also important when you're assessing the mitral, you know, mitral lesions. Again, every one of you know this, you know, I'm sure everyone in the room know what's normal mitral valve. And just a quick recap here, one thing is knowing a normal mitral valvular, you know, picture on M mode is very, very important, right guys? So if you see, that's the early filling or the E wave and the late filling or the A wave. And these are all the TTE views of mitral valve, which we all know. And as you all know, hopefully all of us here have two papillary muscles as well, right? So it's the anterolateral and, you know, postromedial papillary muscles as well, which form a part of the mitral apparatus. Again, these are the views, like we just talked about. We have the luxury of looking at everything 3D, 4D these days. So TE is definitely the test of choice for mitral stenosis. If you, you know, if you think transthoracic is suboptimal in any way, we can definitely assess mitral stenosis on TEE, which I think is really gonna give us a lot of incremental information. Let's talk about some of the common causes of mitral stenosis, right? So every one of us know the classic one, right? Rheumatic mitral stenosis. And if you see here, it's mainly characterized by commissural fusion and thickening and also caudal shortening, right? So the whole subvalvular area is thickened and calcified. And again, you see that classic hockey stick appearance or the doming appearance of the mitral leaflet. And one thing I think we should always uh, you know, uh, remember is also the M mode of mitral stenosis, specifically rheumatic mitral stenosis, right? So what do you see here? So you see those thickened leaflets, you see the decreased EF slope from the valve not really opening in diastole, and also one you know, other thing you see is that almost parallel motion of both the leaflets, right? So if you think in normal life, the leaflets have to do this, but in this case, the leaflets are almost moving together, and you see that nicely on the M mode where you almost see that constant diastolic gradient throughout. So very, very, uh, you know, valid information we got, like, you know, even from, my, you know, from M mode, from mitral stenosis from old days. And again, remember, most of the cases were rheumatic in those days, and I think, you know, just diagnosing from M mode itself was, you know, amazingly done. All right, what are the second most common causes? I think every one of us know it's the degenerative or the calcific one, again, right, which mainly causes restricted mobility and poor co-optation. Sometimes it can actually result in mixed disease because it depends on the type of co-optation and if, how if the leaflets are tethered. And as you know, most of our older patients also have other you know, co-associated abnormalities which can also result in some mitral regurgitation as well. And again, all of us know, right? So any predisposing condition, hypertension, diastolic dysfunction, prior chest wall irradiation, CKD, CAD, everything is a risk factor for degenerative or calcific mitral stenosis. Again, difficult to treat. We'll talk about it briefly towards the end of the talk. But again, this is not our simple rheumatic mitral stenosis, which is more straightforward. Some interesting ones, right? Um, anybody here have seen this one? This is carcinoid, right? And I know it's also, if you see, the leaflets are thickened and tethered, and actually it is mainly, you know, usually seen on the right-sided valves, right? Left-sided valvular involvement is less often, but you can actually see, this is a very important board question too, guys. So for echo boards, I think you need to know, and also in general, you need to know when the left side is involved, is mainly when you have a lot of liver metastases and when you also have bronchial carcinoid, which can drain into the you know, left side, and also a presence of a large intracardiac shunt can actually cause the left-sided lesions. And uh, again, radiation valvulitis, I think you know we've been seeing this more often, but unfortunately, the increasing number of cancers lately and patients getting radiotherapy more frequently. And what's more prominent in this case is actually not just valvular calcification. If you pay attention, there is more calcification of the iotomitral curtain as well, right? So the whole curtain or that whole continuity is calcified, and especially in patients who have had chest wall irradiation. So if you see, all the anterior parts are more calcified than the posterior ones. So that's another clue to radiation valvulitis as well. 
And then how can we not talk about our congenital cohort, right? We have a whole like, you know, you know, set of lesions which are which can cause congenital mitral stenosis. I think one interesting one is that parachute mitral valve, actually where you have a single papillary muzzle, which kind of causes, you know, which kind of branches into both the leaflets. And it's almost looking like a hammock, right? When you look at the echo, it looks almost like a, a hammock-like appearance. And that can also cause significant mitral stenosis. Let's talk about evaluation, right? So obviously with ECHO, what we can do, I know I should say wonders, but no offense to our CMR colleagues, but I think just you know having that Doppler ability of the valve is itself our, our strength of ECHO. And again, we're gonna talk a little bit about how do we assess the severity and also <coughs> associated lesions and modifiers. And a quick talk definitely about special situations, which I think you'll appreciate once we talk about them because that's more real life. All right, let's take a look at this video first. Well, hopefully if the video plays. I'm going to just end the slideshow here. All right, Bell, I want to describe this video. Unfortunately, it's not playing, but it's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, a, a video about how we need to look at the big picture, right? So what it is about if you try to look at the micro details, sometimes you can actually miss the bigger picture, right? So the, you know, I really wanted to reiterate the fact that look at the big picture, look at the RB, look not when you're trying to assess mitral stenosis, don't just focus on the mitral valve itself. So let's look at a couple of quick case examples here. And I'll give you the numbers. So we have a peak gradient of 27 and a mean gradient of 14 with a pressure half time of 185 and a mitral valve area of one centimeter square. Right? And the heart rate is 68. So you know this is severe rheumatic mitral stenosis, right? No questions asked, right guys? So if you see classic hockey stick appearance, you see the thickening of the subvalvular components and calcification. Let's look at this one. So if I tell you the peak is 32, mean is 15, and continuity mitral valve area is 0.9, what do you think about this? Right, I think I heard it already, right? So the heart rate is 68. Yeah, exactly. So this is severe calcific mitral stenosis. Again, these are two obvious cases I've put in. You know, in real life, you're not going to have it this obvious, but uh, you really want to, what, what I'm trying to make out is the difference between calcific and rheumatic mitral stenosis too. How about this one? I'll give you a clue. We need to call our congenital friend. We need to call Dr. Duarte for this. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I think you're almost there, right? So it's actually mitral valve arcade. It's actually congenital mitral stenosis, uh, and it's actually complete absence of papillary muscles or shortening of chordae tendinae, and this is uh, one of the beautiful TEs Dr. Zogby did. Uh, it's actually, you know, the whole thing is, you know, suspended directly into the pap muscle. I mean, you know, because imagine no pap muscles, right? So you basically have the caudal attachments directly to the LV myocardium, and it almost looks like a fibrous bridge-like, you know, appearance, and that's what is unique in mitral valvular arcade. So again, this is a case I just wanted to show you so that you're aware about the variance of mitral stenosis we encounter in our lab. All right. Let's take a quick look at valvular anatomy. So again, we we'll, let's go into the indices of assessment on in transthoracic echo. Obviously, we talked about the commissural fusion and in rheumatic mitral stenosis. And again, if you think about it, so what is more important on the echo is also assessing if the valve is you know interventionable, right? So we there are multiple scores we have traditionally known. I know there is something called uh, uh, the classic one, right? The Wilkin score, where actually you give a score ranging from zero to sixteen based on mobility, thickening, caudal involvement, and calcification, right? 
right? So for each component of the valve, you start giving a score, and you, a total score of less than eight is usually considered cut off or pliable for balloon valvuloplasty. So remember this one, right, for sure. And there are other popular counterparts. There is something called Cormier score, which is more simplified version. In this one, all we care about is, is their calcification or not, right? So based on that, you say, hey, is this is too calcified or this is not calcified, so that you get an idea about the balloon ability. And then there is more modern stuff. We have 3D valvular assessment actually based on the cuspal thickening and calcification. You can actually assign a 3D calcification score as well. Let's move on to indices of severity uh, and also how to really assess severity of mitral stenosis, right? So of course, you know, main, main you know, determinant is pressure gradients. And then mitral valve planimetry, not always, but sometimes. Pressure half time, again, in rheumatic mitral stenosis, we use this quite often. Continuity equation, which we use in patients with calcific mitral stenosis. Uh, finally, a little word about a PISA method and other indices of severity. So again, all of us know here, right? So pressure assessments are the key. And again, so the main you know, pressure gradient we use is the mean mitral gradient, right? So thanks to the computer, we don't have to do all those numbers. So these days, it's they give a, the computer does this, and it generates a mean gradient for us. And again, we've known for ages how it correlates very well with actually assessing the real mitral valve area too. And one thing I do want to mention, you know, especially, you know, it's a talk where we really really want to know about the differences of Doppler, right? The strength of Doppler on echo versus cat has been a debatable point for multiple years. But one thing, I don't want to confuse you too much, but one take home point is definitely echo is the, the modality of choice when you really want to assess the peak gradient because cat can always underestimate the peak gradient, right? So the peak to peak on the cat is actually, you know, related to the mean gradient of the, on the echo. And again, you know, uh, remember, you know, it also in CAT, it also depends on the timing of assessment, there is overlap, and also depends on what type of catheter we use in the CAT as well. But what are the pitfalls? Are the gradients always correct? What are the limitations, right? So we all know in real life, it's always not this ideal 60 beats per minute. So patients can have variable heart rate. And uh, so, but remember that, you know, the mean gradients or the peak and the mean gradients are highly dependent on heart rate and flow rate. And if you look, I mean, obviously if there are higher heart rate translates to high transmitral gradients. And again, one entity I really want to point out here is that low flow, low gradient, severe mitral stenosis. I know our aortic counterpart is more famous than the mitral counterpart, but it is existent. I mean, right, imagine when there is a low flow state on the mitral side with a mean gradient of less than 10 and the stroke volume index of less than 35. And actually, I really love the term. I should give credit to Carlos about this term. Dr. El Talavi was saying how metastatic RV, right? If you have significant mitral stenosis, which actually eventually resulted in RV failure, MS, I should say. <laughs> uh, and it causes severe TR and decreased flow on the left side. You can actually have this low flow, low gradient, severe mitral stenosis state. How can we not talk about this? We can't forget Dr. Little and mitral valve, right? So we always talk about this, and I think it's a point of debate in you know a lot of labs. And uh, I'm sure you all know what are we, what am I, you know, talking about, right? So sometimes when you do TEE, you see this double envelope, or you know, uh, or reflection, which is from the back wall of the LA. And actually, there was this huge debate on uh, Twitter about what exactly is this. And actually, they did, you know, demonstrate that it's actually over gain, which results in that double envelope, right? So they actually went and did like an on tested it on multiple patients they reduced the gain and uh, basically reproduced the numbers so the bottom line is use the denser envelope inside right the modal velocity or the denser envelope is the real one all right how about planimetry is it still existent Yes and no, right? Maybe 3D, but I think one thing I think, and I remember, you know, I think Dr. Zogby always mentions too, is how the whole valve is actually funnel shaped, especially in stenosis. It's not a simple orifice like this, right? You have a, a tunnel or a funnel, 
where it's hard to really gauge where you're really sampling from, right? Whenever you're doing, it's hard to say, are you really at the tips or not? So 3D can sometimes be helpful, especially when you align the planes nicely and you really know you're at the tips. I think that's when the planimetry really works. But again, there are limitations, right? You need a beautiful picture for that. You need uh, a you know, clear valve. Like So if you have a lot of calcifications, it's hard to write, really trace out the opening. And also, no prior history of commissurotomy, because once you do commissurotomy, again, it alters the tip anatomy, so it becomes a little difficult. And one thing I really want to point out here is the severity, right? So you know ACCHA guidelines have more recently called less than 1.5 as severe, and also called less than 1 as very severe. But again, once we hit that 1 to 1.5 range is when you start wanting to thinking, you know, think calling it severe. How can we not talk about pressure half time, right? So this is the time interval between the maximal mitral gradient and early diastole to where the gradient is half, right? Simple, pressure half time, right? When that's the peak, become half of it. Again, mitral valve area, you know, everybody knows about the Gorlins formula, right? The traditional 220 divided by pressure half time in milliseconds. But again, it does come with, comes with its own pitfalls, right? So you all know, right, guys? So when, when can we not? What's the classic one where we really cannot use this? Right, and? Exactly, exactly. And so also immediately right after balloon alveoloplasty, right? So you can't use that. And if you look at the contour, which one you think you like better, guys? The left or the middle or the right one? The left, I think. I think all of us are in agreement with that, right? So obviously, you want to see that early diastolic slope better, and actually you can use that line drawing method also, right? If you're not sure, just draw a line straight across and use that mid portion where it's more clear, right guys? So you don't necessarily have to kind of use the you know, suboptimal ones. Continuity equation, right? You know, you, we all know we can use this. We all especially prefer this in cases with calcific mitral stenosis. All you need to know is you're just using the flow as flow, right, no matter where it is, divided by the VTI of the mitral valve, right? So stroke volume by any means, usually on echo we get it through the LVOT. You divide it by the mitral valve VTI, you get the mitral valve area. But can you use it in every situation? Maybe not, right? Because in patients, imagine you have significant MR, your gradients and VTI is driven by that, right? AFib, the main thing you want to remember is the flow matching, right? You want to make sure that the RR intervals are comparable when you're doing this. PISA method, how many of you know that PISA exists for MS? I'm sure not many know. There is, there is actually. But it's definitely more cumbersome and in good olden days, actually when I was a resident, I think we, we were using it on TEEs. Uh, so there is a method, but again, I don't think it's something we use in you know, clinical life because it's definitely more cumbersome and less validated. Rarely, if it's a very discrepant case, you're not sure, I think you can really use that to assess the mitral valve. And again, remember, it can't be used in patients who have significant MR. Let's talk about the you know, main clinical problems we have in real life, right? So let's, uh, let's look at these special situations or discrepancies. So very common situation. I think I'm going to ask every one of you about this. Did you ever think about, hey, when do I really use pressure half time versus continuity? I'm sure, right? All of us have encountered this. So when, right? So one thing is, remember, calcific mitral stenosis is very different. You know, it behaves differently. The disease itself is different. So you obviously have, you know, the shape is different. The, the hemodynamics are different. The compliance of the LA and LV is very different. And also, gradients are not always reliable, right? We just talked about it. I mean, high heart rate, low heart rate, flow situation is different. You can't just rely on one number and say, hey, my mean is six, so I'm going to go with this, right? And then the pressure half time, we just talked about the limitations of that. So again, finally, I would say, use your judgment, right? So look at the pathology and then go into the numbers. So first of all, look at the valve, look at the you know LV, look at the pathology possibly, and then go into calculations. So let's take a quick look at this example. So in this case, we have a pressure half time of 270 with a mean gradient of six and a VTI of 49, right? So if you look at pressure half time, it's 0.8, right? Versus if you lose, use the continuity is 1.86. So why am I bringing this example? 
If you look at the heart, I mean, you know, so what, is it rheumatic or, or calcific, guys? Tell me that. Calcific, right? So and also it looks like the LV is a little thick, right? So you know there is a component of diastolic dysfunction in this. So very important to know situations with elevated LVEDP, right? What happens when the LVEDP is elevated, guys? The pressure half time? Shortens, exactly. So when you're using, and that goes in the denominator, right? So that's why you want to be aware in, of cases of diastolic dysfunction where you just can't use the traditional numbers. So if you actually, um, you know, look at it, it's actually not, not that bad, right? All right, the next situation is presence of significant MR or AR, definitely, right? MR, don't use continuity because your stroke volume is gonna be limited. And AR, you can't use pressure half time because AR causes, what does AR cause? Significant AR causes elevated LVDP, right? So that can actually screw up your pressure half time again. We just talked about this. Every patient, I should say most of them have atrial fibrillation, right? Anybody with mitral stenosis, big LA, LA anatomy is very different, so they all have a tendency to go into atrial fibrillation. So in cases with AFib, you want to average at least five cycles, right? Or at least use representative beats. So use the RR interval, which is comparable when you're comparing it. There are other parameters too. So there is pulmonary artery pressures we can use, SSRV basically, and use that. Mitral valve resistance, I know we don't use it quite often, but it is another entity we can use. And then exercise or dobutamine stress echo in case of equivocal or discordant symptoms. So very important, right? So in real life, actually, you'll see this more often than normal. Patient comes in, has a little bit of mitral stenosis. Now she starts saying, hey, I have shortness of breath, I have problems. So now you're like, do we really need to assess the valve further? And I think, you know, dobutamine or exercise are super helpful in that situation. I mean, we'll talk about that in a second as well. So again, so, you know, after all these calculations, so we are gonna really assess the severity based on, you know, the valve area, the mean gradient, and the PA pressures, right? Especially at heart rate of 60 to 80 beats per minute and a normal sinus rhythm, these numbers hold good. But again, what determines everything is symptoms, right? So that's another important thing. So I think, uh, you know, the ACCHA valve guidelines have reiterated that quite well and separated that out because once you start having symptoms, it's a totally different situation. Let's take a look at this case example. So we have a 58-year-old male who was asymptomatic in 2013. If you look, how is the valve looking, guys? Very normal looking, right? So it looks like it's opening well. If you look at the valve area, it's 2.3 and a PA pressure is 32. So what do you call this one? Nothing, normal, right? So it's like nothing. Now the patient comes back in 2015 and you start seeing this. So you have some minimal exertional symptoms. You start seeing that the annulus is getting calcified, right? PA pressures are going up, so moderate mitral stenosis, right? Now the same patient comes back. Now he's having decreased exercise tolerance. Now his mean gradient is seven at a heart rate of 66, right? So now we are hitting the moderate to severe range. What do we do? Refer him to Val Clinic, I guess, right? Call Dr. Faza, call Dr. Little, no? Exercise, exactly, right. So basically this patient cannot exercise, so we dobutamine him. But that's, that's exactly what we need, right, Rodi? So it's almost there, but not quite there, and you're trying to really elicit the hemodynamics further. So you exercise, and actually, you know, his mean gradient went up to 19, right? And his PA pressure went up to more than 60. And again, more than 15 with exertion and more than 18 with dobutamine is characteristic you know, it's characteristic of severe mitral stenosis. So always know when to use, you know, a stress echo to get more information about the valve. Well, how can I not talk about our multimodality friends here? And, uh, you know, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think we need redemption from my last talk, so I'm gonna show that soon. But definitely I think TE, when TTE is suboptimal, and especially we just talked about 
every patient of mitral stenosis having AFib, right? So I think we use TEE almost every patient to assess left atrial appendage, uh, you know, in all these patients for rhythm management. And I think that's very helpful too. Invasive hemodynamics, I don't think we use this quite often. And, uh, you know, we, I think we have enough modalities on non-invasive side. So I think we can reserve this for really tough cases. Uh, one thing I think is helpful is definitely right heart cath, though, right? Especially if you want to get that PBR numbers and look at the PA pressures better, I think right heart cath is beneficial. Well, I'm going to defer uh, to Dr. Nabi to talk about CMR and CT, but I really think, you know, uh, you know CMR and CT are very complementary to ECHO in giving us more information. And quick words about intervention. Again, I don't want to you know, take too much of time, but I really want you to know when do we really consider um, a, a repair or a replacement or any intervention on the mitral valve, right? So any patient with symptomatic mitral stenosis, valve area of less than 1.5, with a pressure half time of more than 150, and a mean gradient of five to 10, obviously, right? But the first thing you want to assess is significant MR or not, right? Less than moderate MR, we are good, and no LA thrombus, right, before you fix the mitral valve. So favorable anatomy for all this, and the Wilkins score is reasonable, then you go for percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty. And what if it is not? Then you go for surgical or transcutaneous valve replacement, right? Versus calcific mitral stenosis. I think we can just talk about this in a separate talk in itself because it's so complex, right? It's not just about the valve. I think it's the big picture in this one which matters. Very poor prognosis, usually less than 50% survival in five years. Intervention reserved for highly symptomatic patients. So one thing I always think about when we talk about calcific mitral stenosis is remember guys, it's the whole AV groove, right? Imagine if the whole AV groove is calcified and what do you do when you do valve replacements and cabbages? Tell me that, guys. So, you know, how many of you have seen like a circumflex bypass? It's not easy, right? So you have to lift the heart, right? And you're trying to move the heart to the side and you're trying to access the lateral wall, right? So when you have a lot of calcium and when you're trying to replace, what can happen? Exactly, it almost breaks, exactly. It's almost dehiscence. So, uh, so that's a very, imagine even transcatheter interventions in MAC I think is not easy because you're trying to put a valve on something which you're not sure if it's gonna sit on the valve properly or not. So there is higher chances of dehiscence and there is higher chance of paravalvular leaks in such cases. And decalcification, I mean, there is also talk about, hey, why don't we just take out all the calcium surgically, right? So I think there is concept of decalcification, but imagine doing that in a calcified, heavily thickened area, right? So the risk of disruption and injury to circumflex, coronary sinus, conduction system, all that is super high. So it's definitely not an easy surgery. What are the options in those patients? I think, you know, uh, you know we are gonna have TMBRs in MAC procedures these days. And then uh, there are novel degradable metal and elastomeric based scaffolds which can also be used. That's another hopefully future promise. And LA to LV conduit or bypass is also another option as well. All right, I think we need to quickly talk about the summary. So I think echo Doppler still remains the first line modality for mitral stenosis. Attention to details, very crucial. And integration of findings is very important, guys, right? So again, symptoms, 2D picture, and Doppler findings, so look at the big picture. So I think uh, we were trying to show this in our IOTIC stenosis talk, but uh, I think it's more on this one in reality, right? So we are all friends at the end of the day. <laughs> Echo is open to all of, all of you guys, so thanks. <laughs> All right. Th thanks again, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. And I can't think of anybody else other than Dr. Nabi to talk about this. Thank you. Well, you were nice to us to stand in. This. I might interject for the fellows. Um, we the reason why the reason why the guidelines have increased the threshold for severe mitral stenosis from what used to be one. 1.5 is because all the cath correlation data shows that these people are more likely to have a high wedge pressure, defined by a wedge pressure more than 15. So it wasn't based on prognostic data, but it was based on symptoms. With an area of less than 1.5, you're more likely to have a high wedge, more likely to have symptoms. So just a one uh, caveat for you guys for the for the world. So when I first figured out that I had to do this talk, 
uh, I told Bindu, you know, please just give me 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't need more than that, you know, but I, I was surprised. There's a lot I think I can share with you guys um, uh, with the advanced imaging in mitral stenosis. So, uh, you know, as I think Bindu, there's no doubt showed you that really when it comes to the initial diagnosis and, you know, the following of the disease, echo really is the gold standard. And, um, and this is also obviously, you know, spelled out very specifically in the guidelines. Now, what I found interesting, and uh, believe it or not, the reference for this is referencing a paper from Dr. Quinones. So, you know, we, if he was here in the audience, we could ask him about it. But, you know, valve area actually using 2D and 3D is the reference measurement for mitral stenosis severity. So it's really valve area. And now, Valve area, obviously, we can get either by planimetry, which is going to be some of this, you know, the, the, the strengths of what I'm going to be showing you. But of course, then it can also be obtained by pressure half time and continuity equations. And, and, and we know already, as Bindu has already discussed, that when it comes to pressure half time continuity equations, there's a lot of limitations. You have LV, LALV compliance issues, you have significant ARMR issues, all of this which are quite common and prevalent in these patients. Uh, mean transvalvular gradients can also sometimes lead us in the wrong way. Uh, it's, you know, these are very dependent on heart rate and very dependent on transvalvular flow rates. So uh, we have to, and, and diastolic filling periods. So we have to be very aware of that when we're interpreting. And, and then when it comes to PA pressures, you know, uh, really the, you know, th this is more a result or uh, reflectant of the consequences of mitral stenosis and probably has prognostic role because you can have severe MS with normal, you know, uh, PA systolic pressures. So I really, you know, uh, again, just highlighting the importance of uh, an actual, being able to obtain an actual valve area. So, um, now, you know, in many lectures in the past, and myself and others have told you all the strengths of some of these advanced techniques, you know, with their large field of views, excellent spatial and temporal resolution, ex excellent contrast to noise ratios. All of those things really let us define the anatomy very, very well. And so, you know, following along Dr. Shrubru's uh, line of thinking, you know, I hope to show you that we can be complementary to ECHO. And uh, some of the information that we can provide is very similar to what you guys are looking for when you're interpreting an echo. We can tell you about the morphology of the valve and help make a diagnosis of mitral stenosis. We can grade the severity, and we'll go into a little bit of, of that, how to planimeter a mitral valve area. We can then look at the consequences of that mitral stenosis on the heart, specifically looking at, you know, what is happening to the left atrium, you know, uh, uh, RV function, RV size, PA pressures, things like that. And then I think, that, you know, which is really the domain of CT is when it does come down to very calcific mitral stenosis and, and you have to, and you are considering intervention, you know, this is really where CT is, uh, comes into play and um, um, some really, you know, really exciting work that's going on in this space. So etiology, you know, Bindu again uh, really emphasized a lot of this very, very well. The most common etiology worldwide is rheumatic mitral stenosis, and this is defined by thickening of the valve leaflets as well as um, commissural fusion. So the valve, when it opens in diastole, you kind of see this fish mouth shape. You can have some mild degrees of calcification. When you look at it in the three-chamber view, uh, you'll often see this hockey sticking, uh, and that's because you know the leaflet tips are you know fused, and you'll get this kind of um, um, what they call a doming or hockey stick appearance. All of that, when you see that, you know, is very you know pathognomonic for kind of a rheumatic process. Um, Uh, these are just some examples of how we can see that same kind of pathophysiology with cardiac MRI. This is a patient who has, you can see the, in, in the three-chamber view, again, very thickened leaflets. You can get that hockey stick appearance. Uh, there's associated mitral regurgitation in this case. 
And maybe if you looked at the short axis, you can see that you know, the valve doesn't seem to open as well and maybe has a fish mouth appearance as well. You can see the size of the left atrium, how big it is. So, and you, know, you can, to some degree, um, in, in, as image quality improves, see the subvalvular apparatus as well. Um, and this is, I, I mentioned that because, you know, when it comes to the Wilkins score and, and you're looking at CMR or, or, or you know, CT for uh, mitral stenosis, a lot of these things we can assess. Now, with CT, you have to make sure you have a multi-phase CT, so you're, you know, pretty much doing a retrospective study to get the entire cardiac cycle. But if you do do that, you know, you're able to, with both CT and MR, you're able to tell about mobility. You can tell about subvalvular thickening, and you can tell about thickening of the leaflets. So three out of four components, you know, you can very easily tell with cardiac MRI for the Wilkins score. Uh, when it comes to calcification, obviously the best test there is CT, really shows calcification very nicely. And, um, you know, this can be a little bit more difficult um, with MRI, but I will show you some cases where, you know, when you see, you know, uh, the, these areas of signal void or darkness, you know, this is an area that's devoid of protons and a signal isn't being generated there, you can kind of infer that there's calcium there. And so, uh, as Bindu had already mentioned, you know, when, when these scores are important because if you're considering uh, balloon valvuloplasty, you know, we try to pick patients who have a score less than eight. So uh, just some more examples of mitral stenosis um, and what we should m see, what we may see in our labs. Again, you see the thickened leaf list, the chordal fusion, the chordal shortening that was meant, the commissural fusion, the chordal shortening. In this particular case, you know, you also have involvement of the aortic valve and you can see aortic insufficiency here. Um, and you know, it's more than likely that that AI, the root size looks normal, the ascending aorta looks normal. So more than likely, you know, the cause of this is the same process that's occurring to the mitral valve leaflets. Uh, similarly, you know, I wasn't uh, aware of this, but you know, um, about in 8% of patients in the literature, you can actually have involvement on the right side of the heart. So this was a patient who has actually some thickening and retraction of the septal leaflet, uh, which resulted in tricuspid regurgitation. So, you know, it is important when you are, you see a case in the echo lab uh, of mitral stenosis and especially rheumatic mitral stenosis that you do examine all the other valves. Now, the other big um, disease popula uh, population that can develop mitral stenosis that we've discussed is, of course, what's known as the non-rheumatic calcific mitral stenosis or the degenerative um, mitral stenosis. This is just due to heavy, bulky calcium at the annulus that kind of grows and extends into the leaflet bases. So it narrows the, you know, the, the annular area and causes rigidity of the leaflet motion. And this is very common in our elderly population, especially here in high-income countries. And this is just an example of you know, um, probably many CTs you've seen like this. Um, calcific MS, uh, you know, Bindu also hit a lot of this. It, again, it's an, a disease mostly of the elderly. They have a lot of concomitant core morbidities, including diseases of the other valves. Overall, a very poor prognosis if you have it with a five-year survival of less than 50%. And that is because these patients have a lot of co-existent uh, um, uh, core morbidities. And if you were trying to fix something like this, you know, it's technically very challenging. Um, determination of severity in these patients can be difficult. Uh, calcium can make it difficult. You know, um, you know, you have changes both to the LA and the LV compliance that can make it difficult. But it is a common entity, and you know, 50% of patients who are going evaluation for TAVR actually have MAC, and in 10% of those, it's severe. So this is a disease you're going to see frequently with all the TAVI population we have here. And they're at high risk for intervention, both surgical, because you can imagine, you know, the surgeon has to suture a valve in place, but if you debride all the calcium, you know, you may not have much tissue left. Uh, 
and it's also a high-risk procedure because of their age and comorbidities. And so the guidelines specifically mention that if you're going to consider, you know, doing a procedure that this is really considered a high-risk procedure and requires really um, a multi-imaging as well as, uh, you know, a multidisciplinary um, uh, involvement to, uh, with active patient involvement before you, you know, send somebody for a procedure. Um, this is just an example of, you know, I, I showed you a lot of MRI pictures, so I wanted to show you that we can create similar pictures with CT. Uh, this was a case who, of, of a patient who had very dense calcific uh, mitral stenosis, you can see here. They, he was a little bit interesting because I think if you pay co close attention, you see a little bit of SAM there. You know, you see that thick septal knuckle and you see some SAM. So it was a, a you know, an, a, an interesting CT that I found. Um, a point I'd like to make here is obviously this, you know, when, when you're trying to assess valvular lesions, uh, it is important to note that when you, if you are going to use CT, there can be a high radiation test uh, because you will be acquiring images throughout the cardiac cycle to be able to produce such pretty images. Um, I had spoken to you that, you know, we can kind of sometimes confer calcium with MRI. So this was a case of very, uh, you know, a, 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 a lot, very heavily calcified mitral valve or by CMR. And uh, it may be hard to see here just because of the way the screen is, but if you were to come here to the monitors, there, there's areas, especially on the short axis view, that look are much, much denser black and whereas, you know, the surrounding muscle is a little bit more brownish tinge. And so those areas of signal void are all calcium. And even on that three-chamber view, you, you know, you can, uh, right at the base of that posterior leaflet, you can see a big chunk of calcium sitting there. So this is kind of how we infer that calcium may be present. Um, now, uh, another entity, of course, of, along with congenital heart disease uh, and the arcade valves and parachute valves and everything that Bindu had mentioned, you know, we're probably another entity of mitral stenosis that you could see is in patients who've had mitral valve replacement and, you know, the annuloplasty ring is a little bit tight. So you may see an inflow gradient there and patients may be symptomatic from that. So how do we grade severity? We've, we, you know, once you've made the diagnosis, how do we actually grade severity uh, with mitral stenosis? And so I, I'll begin with CMR first, and it's very no different from what we did with our aortic stenosis lecture. What you want to do is you want to have very thin slices, and you want to create several cuts through the uh, mitral valve uh, leaflets. And um, the way we do this is, you know, we'll use our long axis slices and we will create you know, plane, a plane that is orthogonal to, let's say, your two long axis slices and then we'll create a sh series of short axis slices that are going right through the leaflet tips. And it's important to be at the leaflet tip, just as Bindu had said, is because oftentimes this can be a funnel. And if you're higher up on the funnel, your valve area is going to be very large. Whereas as you really get down to the leaflet tip, uh, that's where you're going to find your smallest maximal diastolic opening. So in order to do that, you have to use very thin slices and you've got to acquire a lot of parallel slices. You may have to trace all of these and the true valve area will be the smallest maximal uh, diastolic opening that you can trace. And that's kind of what I demonstrate here in this next slide. You know, we went right down. If you look at the, the long axis slices on the left hand side, the yellow kind of line is representative of the short axis slice you're seeing. So we took it and went all the way down to the very, very leaflet tips. You can see, I can see the opening very, very nicely and I can trace inside the border and, and to determine a planimeter valve area. Now, um, you know, how does this actually relate to other techniques that you guys are comfortable with, such as transthoracic echo and echocardio, I mean, and, and invasive cath? Well, not very large studies, but in, in, they have been looked at in patients who've had simultaneous both tests. And when you look at planimeter mitral valve area, you, by CMR, it slightly overestimates it 
um, um, compared to that calculated by echo or cardiac cath. So uh, I think that is one important thing to know. Now, anybody have a guess as to why? And we also mentioned this in the aortic stenosis talks. Whenever you are measuring, an, uh, whenever you planimeter a valve barrier, remember it's a little bit different from the valve barrier you're getting by either echo or invasive cath. Those are more based on, you know, uh, 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 the um, functional area. So in, in general, whenever you planimeter an anatomical area, it'll always be a slightly larger than the functional area. So. What that tells you is that if we come and we trace a valve area of, let's say, one, less than 1.5, you can be confident that, you know, we are truly diagnosing severe aortic stenosis because it can only, it will likely be worse if you were to do it with a functional test such as echo. Uh, this is me doing the same thing, uh, not, not this, actually not this one, but this is, uh, you know, this is how we do it by CT. It's really no different. Take your long axis slices, you know, really go down to the leaflet tips. These are isotropic voxels with 0 0.5, uh, uh, you know, 5, uh, 0.5 millimeter uh, spatial resolution. So you can really, uh, you know, preliminary and, and see the orifice um, uh, with great detail. And again, you want to do it, you know, in the diastolic phase with the widest valve opening uh, by tracing along the orifice and the leaflet edges. Uh, this was a case here in our own lab, uh, just to show you that, you know, how easy it is to do, uh, you know, and just the quality of images that you can produce uh, to be able to do this. Um, CT is also not to be left behind, and also it is also an anatomical test, so when it was compared to echo and cardiac catheterization, again, there was a systematic overestimation when compared to those um, uh, uh, functional studies. All right, um, how about trying to quantify valve area wide pressure half time with CMR? So people have done this. Uh, you can actually, you know, go to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, calculate a flow across the mitral valve and use that flow tracing to determine a pressure half time. Obviously, you know, our temporal resolution isn't good as as good as temporal as uh, spectral Doppler, so that's an important consideration. But in this study, they seem to show some reasonable correlation. Um, do we do it in our labs? Uh, we, we definitely don't, and if the patient is atrial fibrillation, you know, it can be very, very difficult. Um, so how can, you know, CMR, you know, and, uh, you know, help us? So I think two situations where it can be very helpful is kind of those two cases that I had shown you. Those patients with mitral stenosis who have either MR or AI, as you know, e both the continuity equation and pressure half time can be complicated in these situations. Um, with MS and MR, you have an increase of flow either through the mitral valve or through the aortic valve, and that can alter your, your continuity equation um, um, and, and therefore your findings. And as well as in patients with, you know, um, AI, as we had already heard, with pressure halftime, you know, just based on the different compliance of, of the left ventricle, you can, you know, you can have uh, problems. So CMR, I think, can be very helpful in, in, in this situation because I've already showed you how easy it is just to do a quick planimetry of the valve, which can be easily done. And in both of these cases, you have the uh, advantage of a very, you know, um, systematic and comprehensive approach to how to assess both the mitral regurgitation and AI as well. So, um, and we've talked about this in, in different lectures where for MR we compare, you know, our LV stroke volume to our aortic flow, flow and for our AI, you know, all we just do is create a phase um, uh, a, a phase contrast uh, slice location right in the ascending aorta and see how much blood comes back into the ventricle. So CMR can, you know, be very helpful in those cases when you want to quantify severity of the AS and MR and also to be active uh, to plenimeter mitral stenosis severity. 
So what about hemodynamic consequences? Uh, you know, this is, this is a tough one for me to be competitive with, with, you know, echo. You know, yes, I can do an amazing job with telling you exact left atrial volumes, either by CMR or CT. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, we can report these out. How it may change your management, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, one thing that definitely is a consequences of the elevated diastolic pressures that your LA will enlarge to try to decrease LAP. Um, um, but I think one place we, we, we have a, 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 a strong strength is, at least for the atrium, is to rule out LA thrombus. And we know patients who have mitral stenosis can have a lot of stagnant blood in the left atrium, and uh, they can, are at risk for uh, 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 developing thrombosis, especially if they have concomitant atrial fibrillation. So this is a case where on the top slices you can see this large mass in the left atrium on echo. CMR is, can be uh, very helpful in the setting of thrombus because it can be very definitive using tissue characteristics to tell you that there's no LGE uptake, which by uh, definition is the definition of a chronic thrombus. And that's what you see by this very dense black uh, in, the, uh, um, in the bottom right. Uh, and that's the thrombus not taking up any contrast. Uh, and, and then, you know, just the same case here, uh, the patient needed a coronary evaluation, so was, was referred for uh, CT prior to, you know, surgical removal of this thrombus, and you can see the thrombus very nicely by CT as well. So I think, you know, we can do a very good job there as well. Um, other things, you know, when it comes to ventricular function, you know, there is no better gold standard than CMR. We've gone over lectures how we do that. CT also has two ways we can measure function, both by the threshold segmentation that we can do or the two Simpsons method, just like CMR. So you can get very detailed information on ventricular volumes and function, both for the left side as well as the right side. And the right side here is more important uh, because that is downstream, uh, that is upstream from the uh, mitral valve. Um, a lot of these patients may have pulmonary hypertension. Uh, again, you know, pressures and flows are, are transmitted back. And although we cannot measure TR velocities by CMR or CT, we look for signs of pulmonary hypertension in an indirect manner. So both with CT and CMR, you know, you'll see flat, a D-shaped septum or flattening of the septum by high RV pressures pushing the septum towards the left, and so you can kind of see this D-shaped pattern. You can see that in the second CT slice as well, you kind of get a very flattened septum rather than that natural curvature that we're used to seeing. We can look at PA sizes. Uh, you know, the PA can be enlarged both for either pressure or volume, and so it can just be a supporting feature that if it is uh, dilated that your patient may have pulmonary hypertension. And then also, Another sign that we can see is if you have regurgitant contrast, either gadolinium or um, iodine in the hepatic veins, that can be a sign of elevated right atrial pressures. So those are kind of some of the, you know, um, indirect signs that we look for uh, when looking for pulmonary hypertension. Now, this is really uh, one thing that um, I know we say CT, uh, C, CT specifically can do very, very well, and this is uh, really a strength of it, um, of the technique. Let's see if we can trick it. Um, we know that when it comes to the evaluation of uh, a, a patient with rheumatic mitral stenosis, Bindu has already kind of gone through the workflow of what indications you look for. But the main things I just want to highlight, what's contraindicated, you know, obviously if you have a valve area that's not severe, uh, if you find LA thrombus or you find significant degrees of mitral regurgitation, you know, um, uh, these are patients who are not good candidates for a balloon valvuloplasty. Similarly, if you have other reasons to go to the operating room, such as concomitant CAD or another valve that's bad, you know, these are patients you want to consider surgical therapies. 
Um, when it comes to calcific MS, as was mentioned, you know, there's really no role for a commissurotomy, either by balloon or surgical. And this is really difficult for the surgeons to deal with because you can't, you know, once you peel off all the calcium, you may not have any tissue left to hold the prosthesis. Um, and the other issue is, and even if you did place a prosthesis, you know, uh, you have an elderly patient, you have their concomitant comorbidity, so their symptoms may not even improve. Um, and then there's always the fear that when you do replace the mitral valve, that they could result in LVOT obstruction. So these, you know, and the guidelines are very specific here that it really requires, a, a, you know, a comprehensive discussion with uh, a multidisciplinary approach. Now, on the market, there are many different types of percutaneous valves. Um, there are, this is just a, a graphic of some of the more common names you have probably heard in our, our you know, uh, being mentioned. Uh, what's important to know is, you know, they all by CT have different requirements because they're all, some can be annular, some can be superannular, some can be, you know, um, uh, attached to the annulus, some are attached to, you know, chordae that are attached to the apex of the heart. You know, they all have their own mechanism of uh, fixation, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, fixation of where they need to be. So, and they all have different shapes and sizes, as you can see. So, each of these, you know, require, depending on what valve is used in your institution or what your, uh, you know, interventionalist is planning to use, you know, will require different data from the CT uh, in order to plan your procedure better. And this is just a little graphic going into that. I'm not going to spend too much time, but just trust me that, you know, not only are there different sizes, but they all anchor differently. All key measurements are kind of different. So, you know, it, you're, you really have to have knowledgeable people in structural heart disease to take you through these CTs. Um, and, and this just shows you how complementary CT can be when it's uh, for the evaluation of TMVR. TMVR. You know, ECHO really gives you fantastic hemodynamic information and visualization of the valve. But it, when it comes down to a lot of what I'm going to be showing you, what CT can do, and that's really demonstrate anatomy in great detail to make sure you have the correct anatomy for the valve, uh, CT really, ha you know, uh, is, is the major strength here. Um, and this was just one study that was recently published. They, you know, they looked at all their patients who TMVR was being planned and had pre-procedural CTs. And what they found was that the most common indications were for patients who were going for either valve and valve, valve and MAC, or valve and ring were your most common indications. And of those 88 patients, only 36% met criteria for you know, a valve, whereas 64% there were some finding on the CT that took the patient away that made, made it a contraindication for the valve. And this included things like too large of an annulus, uh, the risk of LVOT obstruction, uh, insufficient MAC, things like that. So CT, again, can be very, very, hel is very helpful to help you select the correct pr patient for these very complicated and difficult procedures. Um, this is just some graphics I wanted to show you at you know, some of the different measurements that, you know, um, uh, us in the CT lab have to think about and what we know what our interventionists are going to ask for. There, you know, we can look at the mitral valve and almost create a, you know, a D-shaped annulus, although that annulus is really saddle-shaped, but for the purposes of CT we can sat flatten the saddle and create this D-shaped um, uh, figure. And you can, you know, you can measure trigone to trigone, you have a septal to lateral distance, and you have an intercommissural distance. All of these help you size the device that the patient is going to get. Similarly with CT, you know, you have to have a lot of knowledge about the landing zone. What is the landing zone? It's that entire area where that valve is going to occupy. So it's, you know, it's the annulus, what the, what the calcium is doing there, you know, what's going on with the cordae, what's going on with the pap muscles. What's going on with the muscle right there? Is there a myocardial shelf? How long are the leaflets? Uh, um, you know, and where do the pap muscles insert? So a lot of information that we have to be aware of. 
And this is just some examples you know, of actual images uh, from real CTs showing you how some of these measurements are done and made. <clears throat> um, this is an example of uh, showing you the landing zone and different anatomies that are looked for. You know, the landing zone, again, is the area where the valve is going to occupy. So like Bindu had said, pretty much, you know, you know e everything in that mitral valve complex is, are, will, have, uh, uh, will be of critical Im importance. Uh, you know, so including all the cords, the pap muscles, the muscle itself, calcium, you know, length of leaflets, what the left atrium is doing, all becomes very, very, very important. Um, when it comes to determining how much calcium there is, you know, calcium is a good guy and a bad guy at the same time. It's a good guy because it can help, you know, anchor some of these valves in place. And based on the amount of calcium you have is dependent, you know, helps you decide what sort of valve you're going to get. It can be a problem at the same time as well because, you know, it may not allow your valve to conform to its correct shape and size. You may develop paravalvular defects, leaks, and all, all those other complications. So, um, you know, it, but main point for this slide from an imaging perspective is there's no better test than CT to help you quantify or to be able to look at calcium. One of the feared complications of uh, these procedures is that you can actually, with the valve, uh, obstruct the LV outflow tract. But uh, what's nice is that we have the ability with CT to actually, um, uh, actually model what the so-called NEO-LVOT would predict it to be. The NEO-LVT is with the device in place. It's the relationship, you know, it's the amount of area that's left between the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the septum. So with all of these now, the, the software packages come, you know, where you can actually take a virtual valve, place it in your patient's act, patient specific model that you have, and actually be able to quantitate an, uh, an LVOT area. And um, although there's no validated cutoff for, you know, what a minimal neo LVOT cross sectional area has to be, um, I think most people agree that an ideal candidate should have an area of more than uh, 200 millimeters squared. And the next slide is just an example of this modeling that can occur with the specific valve that you want and the patient's specific anatomy. And you can actually, uh, you know, kind of model that, if, you know, the first image is 1.5 centimeter was predict, uh, predicted, and that's exactly what it was, you know, 1.3. Uh, when the patient actually had the valve, and then the other case is one where 1.5 was predicted and it was 1.4. So we, you know, it's a pretty robust way to tell you um, uh, whether your patient will uh, have LVOT obstruction or not. Um, other things that can really increase the risk of, what do you call it, um, neo-LVOT obstruction includes the aortomitral angle. The larger the angle this is, the more risk of having LVOT obstruction. Um, the basal interventricular septal thickness, the more thick this is, the more chance you have LVOT obstruction, and the anterior mit mitral leaflet length. The longer it is, the greater the chance that when it opens and is held in place by that valve, you know, it's going to obstruct the LVOT. And of course, the small LV cavity size. So these are the things that we can appreciate with CT. Uh, finally, you know, you guys are all experts at this, you know, the mitral annulus is right next to the circumflex, so it's important to probably know a little bit about the coronary arteries, and CT can show you that. Planning the transeptal procedure, because a lot of these you can do transeptally, and so you can see the septum and plan where best to cross in order to have the best angle to deploy your valves. Um, a lot of some of these cases require transapical approaches, so we can actually tell exactly what rib space the patient you can access to hit the apex of the heart. Uh, and then, of course, you know, y'all are used to the TAVI field where, you know, peripheral vasculature really is a strength of CT. So I'd like just to conclude there that I hope I've shown you that, you know, CT, CMR uh, can be comp complementary to ECHO in the, mal in the evaluation management of mitral stenosis. Any questions?
Thank you so much. Have a good day.